Hey there, welcome to Data Democracy. This is a podcast where we explore ways to make data and AI more accessible to everyone. We do this by interviewing experts across industries, asking them how they think about data, what are some of the challenges they face when it comes to data, and what's their dream state for data and AI. If they had a magic wand and time and resources were not constraints, what kind of intelligence and models would they wish to have? Thank you for tuning in. Enjoy the episode. We have a great guest today, James Chance. James is an entrepreneur, investor, and a leader in product, data, and strategy. James is the founder of Yourself Online, an AI-driven reputation management software. It was acquired by Legal Shield in 2021, which is where we met. James has worked at Google and Accenture in the past. He graduated from London Business School and UT Austin. James runs an independent product consulting practice now. If you need help with product, reputation management, small business solutions, or strategy, James is your guy. Give him a shout. James is not only a great leader, he's also a great person. He easily passes the, hey, I'd love to grab a beer with this guy test. So let's welcome James. (laughs) Hi, Mitzi. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you. Thanks, James. Uh, How are you? Yeah, doing very well this morning. Doing very well. Looking, uh, looking forward to the holidays. Awesome. Me too. Um, yeah, let's start with your story. Uh, can you tell us about your know, journey so far, um, your background in product and entrepreneurship? Oh, where to start? That's a, that's a, that's a good one. Um, so I, I, you know, I've, I've had a had a sort of. Um, fairly traditional and fairly untraditional career at the same time. Um, so I, you know, my, my background in undergrad was was mechanical engineering. Um, I kind of came out of my undergrad and, and discovered I actually wanted, you know, I was always, um, you know, sort of more interested in the business side of, of things. And I, ever since I was a, a teenager, I'd really had an interest in, in entrepreneurship and, uh, and, you know, Pretty much since I can remember, I've always had little business ideas on the go and and things like that. Um, so when I was, um, you know, I, I, I kind of after I came out of doing my undergrad, uh, really wanted to go into something a little bit more uh, entrepreneurial to and, and, and kind of uh, business sort of in, a, in, a, in the context of of, um, of of undergrad choices. So I ended up going to um, be a, consult- a con- management consultant at Accenture. Uh, I took this view because it gave me the opportunity to see lots of different types of businesses in different industries and 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 kind of learn them and 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 really um, you know be able to use some of my my skills in engineering from more of a quantitative side um, and you know on these different projects and and um, but at the same time be able to see different businesses in different industries and 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 kind of get more of an idea of where I wanted to go from there so I, I was um, at Accenture for about four years um, then after that I, I I'd sort of over my time I'd specialized in in retail and I had spent some time primarily looking with with quite a, a few of the old big box retailers and it was in the mid 2010s, and I, I kind of thought, hang on a second, like I've spent quite a lot of time working with, with retailers that aren't really doing so well. What happens if where's where's the exciting stuff in retail? And it was all really at that time around e-commerce and 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 looking at you know, digital marketing to grow, e-commerce brands and and retail brands as, as well, and um, was fortunate to um, one of my. Uh, sort of one of my friends was working at Google and, and he knew their their retail team uh, and they were looking for somebody who was they're looking for somebody to join that team uh, in, in the role of an analytical consultant and um, what that that role was doing was it was working uh, really as the the kind of liaison between these big retailers so the likes of kind of Amazon eBay uh, and Google and, and, and being a mix of a partnerships person and also a, a sales person and sort of helping to maintain and grow that relationship. And I, I, in my role, I was working alongside, um, you know, working alongside the sales folks uh, as an analyst, as, a, as, a, as effectively like a data analyst. And, and I was looking at some of the data that Google has uh, and saying, how can we 
you know, use some of the things that Google, the data that Google has across its products um, to help our clients grow their businesses and then at the same time help Google grow their business. Um, so this was this was really one of the things I was doing was kind of taking my knowledge of retail from my consulting days and actually applying kind of more skills in 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 data and and, and sort of data science and looking at these quite big data sets that Google gathers across things like search, across maps, things like that, and asking, you know, answering, use it to answer questions of what types of customers are entered into what types of products and different geographies, how are those different customer markets growing, contracting, all of those things. Um, I got, uh, over my time, I got a whole load of different kind of different assignments of, of, of areas that we were trying to the Google and these, these these retailers were trying to grow. Um, I got things like, um, you know, trying to understand the, uh, you know, the, even the sort of questions like, what's the market size of uh, women's plus size fashion in Germany? Uh, and it's like, okay, if you use all the searches, how much of the searches translates into people buying things, and you can kind of roughly market size. So there were some questions like that. It was, it, it was, it was good fun. Um, and then I sort of felt after a while, um, I was sitting in meetings and, and realizing that there were, I was, that my, my knowledge was kind of, I was sort of running out of knowledge. And, and I was going, sitting in meetings with, with, with Google, some of the Google management team and some of the clients. And, and they were talking about stuff that I just really didn't understand, like, um, you know, uh, ROI on, on, av uh, on advertising, uh, you know, looking at sort of what, uh, setting a three-year marketing strategy, looking at setting a three-year growth strategy. And it went, hang on a second, I think I need to take myself, you know, and that's the time to go and do an MBA, um, just so I could really get that knowledge and kind of level up a bit more around some of these, these bigger strategic um, sort of questions. Um, so I went to do a do an MBA for uh, two years at London Business School and, and the University of Texas. Um, focused on uh, entrepreneurship and, and growth businesses uh, whilst I was uh, doing the MBA and, and was fortunate when I was there, I um, came up with the idea for, for my business, which was yourself, yourself online and was fortunate to be kind of hanging out with a good friend of mine who was also then became the co-founder of my business who I'd met whilst I was at, at Google, um, Dimitrios, shout out to Dimi, Dimi if you're, if you're watching the podcast. Um, and uh, he, he, you know, we were sort of talking about some of the things we were seeing and we were seeing this kind of rise of, of cancel culture on social media uh, and also having a few of my friends from the MBA, but also a few of my friends from undergrad that were in serious jobs like lawyers and bankers. Uh, getting really concerned about, you know, the, the, the image and their online reputation uh, based on their social media posts that were were often years old. And, and, and we were on a stage sort of towards the late 2010s, like 2017, 2018, where people were being increasingly judged more and more by what they posted a long time ago. Even if those things are not illegal or anything like that, it's just, you know, things that were bad bad moments of judgment coming back to haunt people and, and they're not getting jobs or they're not getting um you know they're not they're not getting you know sales opportunities or jobs or promotions just purely by the basis of, of, of what they posted online you know in, in, in 10 years ago before then um and and so that was we, we then thought hang on there's a problem here let's uh let's sort of work together and try and see if we can come up with something to to, to solve it and um we came up with the idea for yourself online and, and yourself online was our, our vision for yourself online was to really help people manage their their online reputation or all their online persona um, and to make and to start off to doing that making people aware of, of what their online persona really is so, so being able to kind of and on our first version of the product was really focused around a almost a, a report card of your your online reputation um, showing the things that are good showing the things that are bad highlighting any areas of improvement um, and, and that was and then, and then from that then we then developed the product over time to be a uh, more holistic service that helped people to um, you know, to, to, to clean up the bad, but then also to grow their online reputation in a way that's positive uh, so that they could, you know, access opportunities more easily, you know, have a better LinkedIn presence, 
have guidance around how to build a professional online reputation in, in a way that gives them access to opportunities. Uh, so it's more of an asset rather than a, a liability. Yeah, absolutely. I I've always thought about yourself online like a friend having your back. You know, <laughs> uh, it's it's really it's it's a really solid product. I've, I've definitely used that. Uh, what are some of the challenges you faced when you know building company and scaling it? I know it was a really new idea. Uh, what did you have to solve for, and were there any challenges? I think that there were there were definitely a lot of along the way. Uh, I mean, with any with any uh, with any kind of entrepreneurial venture, there's always things that you things that you think you're going to get, and then there are the things that you you don't know you're going to get. You know, the, the sort of the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. Um, so we we you know we we had a some of the challenges really were that we found over the course of the company and when I look back over the the, the total journey from initial kind of concept uh, in about 2018 uh, early 2019 through to the kind of sale of the business to Legal Shield at the end of 2021 we had what almost could be described as three different companies because we went through the initial stage of, of trying to find product market initial product market fits um and uh, which which had some challenges around the which features we were introducing trying to make sure that we were really trying to solve for the right thing and and, and that we weren't over over complicating our, our our initial product offering uh, so that was the first one and, and then after that you know I, I think then it then became more once we had initial product market fit it was really around around scaling and, and some of the scaling challenges both from a technological perspective as, as more people use the product and uh, from everything from uh, sort of compute through to product quality as you get more as, 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 as the product saw more things we, we found we had challenges that way through to kind of organizational issue, you know organizational challenges around how we we kind of organize ourselves from a people perspective for growth uh, one of the big the big takeaways just thinking back to, the, to that early stage that i think might be interesting to some of your listeners was we when we first started with yourself online we had this big vision and we we're kind of like we want to be the online guardian for professionals and, and we want to be the service that that helps people to uh, that has their back online and and, and and you know help them to be their best self online which was this really big vision and, and, and pitched as big vision but then when we came to executing it we tried to do too much from the beginning and we we got into a bit of a of a of a of a of a, fall- of, a, of a of a challenge which i think sometimes you can be when you're in the first version of your product you're at mvp stage where you're testing too many things at once and you just don't have the resources to to deliver the product to be able to do that so you end up with uh, like a um you know a product experience that's you know 50 percent of every feature so you end up with almost nothing by the end of it because you you can't win on any feature because you're trying to do too much and we were trying to you know we and at the same time we were struggling to deliver those features and we were also confusing our initial early customers because we were presenting them with what could have been probably three separate products around you know your social media reputation we were talking to people about their privacy we were talking to people about their password breaches which which could have been a very good holistic product over time but we were probably about five years to three or three years too early on that when we, we what we ended up doing and, and one of the things that was a real um was a, was probably one of the big you know aha moments on our journey was actually k- killing two-thirds of the product the early product and just focusing on that reputation part, focusing on helping people to clean up and improve their their social media and professional profiles, uh, and then coming back to over time the privacy angle, the, the you know, and the, the other the other the other kind of more online general holistic online pieces. And one of the things that we that really helped us with this was that we were really we we, we kind of were looking at like what was that those product features that sort of got that aha response you know from from 
from customers where they wanted to really take, you know, get their wallet out of their pocket and go, hang on, where do I pay for this? Um, versus the other things that were features that people are kind of look at and they go, oh yeah, that's a sort of, that's interesting. Like, it's good to know that, but but they're not really, they didn't it didn't really evoke much of a reaction. The world of products is uh, kind of new to me. Um, I guess I've, I've always been in companies with sort of established products uh, where uh, we focused on, you know, sales, marketing, and tech. Um, I recently attended a product workshop and it kind of opened up a whole new world to me. It's like, okay, there's there's a lot here that I need to learn. Uh, could you please uh, demystify the world of product for us? I know there's a lot of phrases, you know, product, what is product? Product development, product management, design. Can you Can you tell us a little bit about it? It's, it's, it's a good one, and I'm, I'm sort of trying to find an easy way to, to sum it up. But I, I think the historical way is, is a good way of putting it and, and a good way of kind of seeing how, how this product has evolved. Because typically, you're exactly right, you know, in, in, in some organizations, you know, generally across all organizations historically, and in some organizations now, you do have this world of, you know, you have a, a very traditional world of, you know, sales, marketing, uh, IT operations, etc. And what was happening that was that across those different organisations, there wasn't one person that was really representing what is the voice of the what is the voice of the customer? Who is the who is representing the customer across these different functions, and who is that in between between the the, the customer and the business strategy that you know the overall business strategy for the company uh, and and product functions have, have evolved really to knit together the different um you know knit together the different functions in a way that enhances collaboration to you know be more focused on achieving business results and to also be more focused on on the, the customer and, and meeting the needs of the customer uh, across the product life cycle from right from sales and marketing right the way through to to operations and even in kind of post post customer uh, journey retention as well um, because typically these have been you know joined uh, in some cases isolated efforts um, that that meant that there wasn't a holistic kind of person that joining to that together and, and that has been the the role of, uh, you know, that's that's kind of how the product manager role evolved, was uh, in in certainly in technology organisations being the person to join together and, and and represent the, you know, join together these different group of stakeholders in a way that um, delivers the strategic goals for that product line, and also bears in mind the customer the customer needs and, and, and represents the customer throughout the, those different parts of the, the organization. Um, probably the, the with, but then within, you know, within the world of product, you know, you then have a, a product manager, a product strategy, you might have um, product development, product design that sit across different parts of the um, uh, in the way that the, the the product function goes to market, so so you you have you know product strategy that will be very much at the kind of the the, the tip of the arm around thinking about the interface between the wider business and corporate and product, uh, and and then you know within underneath that you have a a, a product leadership structure of a, of a product leader and, and product managers. That, and as you move down that structure, it becomes more operational, you know, operationalizing the strategy uh, and then interfacing with those those product managers. You know, you'd have people like a, a product designer who would be working with the product strategy and the voice of the customer and doing those kind of insights and the, the customer discovery. And uh, and also and then on the other hand, on the other end of the, of the life cycle, you'd have people like product marketing that would say, OK, how do we? take the things that we know about the product and take the things that we know about the customer uh, and, and package that in a way that the, the marketing organization can can embrace to execute in and, and kind of be that connect between the two. Yeah, it's it's so interesting. And I think it's really something that every company needs, a mature product. 
So I think there needs to be a time where we um, look into the product and say, okay, mm. can we evolve? Um, can the product evolve and help the customer's current needs? Exactly. And, and it also, the, the, the progress of organizations towards being more product centric is, is, is kind of aligned with their journey to being more customer centric. And when you're looking at, you know, as, as organizations have, have kind of moved over time to be more customer centric and, and showing that that focus on the customer um, achieves better business results in lo a longer period of, over time, um, the, the product organization is, it was sort of brought in as a way to to kind of execute that that and to really keep that focus uh, keep that focus in in mind. And it is only natural that that companies that have been around for a while previously maybe were operating in in a operationally focused or a sales and marketing focused type uh, environment and uh, and. It, is it natural that these all, there isn't you know every every company will go through an evolution absolutely absolutely yeah it's yeah I, I think the world of product is uh, like i said new to me and and it's super interesting and i'm i'm learning a lot um how does data come into play in product you know everything from product discovery to product delivery it's it's super important um i, I think there's the favorite you know the, the the sort of commonly known uh anecdote of of data data trump's opinion and it's super important for a product organization to be making you know data powered decisions throughout that product life cycle um, and you know right from right from almost you know starting to engage with customers on a product and, and and you know right from the very early days right the way through to customers leaving a the product there's got to be data measuring you know it's got to be measured you've got to be measuring the right things in a way that is is joined up and, and cohesive across across the life cycle um some really good examples are that you know it, 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 the, the, the in terms of if we go back to, to thinking about being more focused on the customer how do we know we're more focused to the customer and what are the things that are going to tell us whether we're getting this right it's it's it's, it's data and um so so it you know it's it, it's super super critical absolutely you talked about data being critical for to understand what the customers want i learned that there's like a consensus among the product leaders that customer feedback is often skewed or biased. Concepts such as vocal minority selection bias, expectation fallacies are cited. Can you provide some color to this? I've always thought about customer feedback as the end all be all. Hey, they customer said this, so let's go. I do a survey and then customer said this, let's go do that. So it kind of changed my perspective that, hey, maybe customers only customer feedback is only as good as the questions you're asking or the survey you're putting out so can you talk about how to get customer feedback without really asking them for fee feedback i guess mm -hmm. it, it's a it's a really good one and, and and i think we all feel now that we're in a world that you know, we, as soon as we do something, whether it's um, you know we stay at a hotel, or we go to a restaurant, or we 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 go out to to see some culture or something, we always get hit up with 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 feedback surveys. It, it it seems to be a recurring thing that you know almost every day I I delete the feedback from whatever thing I did yesterday, whether it was going to the grocery store or you know that we we get asked for feedback so many times with these surveys that that we are moving to a point where the people who probably fill those out are are more extreme outliers where you know you either generally you have something bad to say or or you know you may be the other camp or you've had such a great experience that it's amazing and it, and it, it, you you you're you're really focusing on that that explicit feedback that you're gathering is kind of focusing on those 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 tales um of your of your customers and 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 you don't really know where the the middle group is 
um, so although they feedback surveys do provide some indicators they can't be seen as gospel because of as, as you said you know there's the challenge around collection there's the challenge around a survey bias there's challenges around you know making sure that you're getting a, a representative sample uh, the the I, th I think one of the things that is, is important when, when you're gathering data from customers is gathering making sure you're gathering both explicit and implicit feedback so so combining those um uh, qualitative surveys and other kind of qualitative data gathering uh, it is it is very useful to get a pulse check on your customers it's very useful to see what they're calling out and if they're calling out specific things that you need to take action on in in a survey but but making sure you're combining that qualitative feedback with quantitative feedback through measuring the, the customer journey um, and measuring the um the thing measuring the, the the interactions of the customer with your product uh, and really saying okay on you know what are what are the things that i want my uh the x the the action i want my customers to take or i need my customers to take to to, to see whether my business is for the product is forming successfully and the business is doing successfully and 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 how what proportion of my customer base is actually doing those things um and and and, and looking at the customer journey end to end in a way that you can understand um, which which those customers, how are those customers interacting with my business, and what, across which touch points, and how are they using the product, uh, and then you know correlating that information with the uh, you know customer customer um, life lifetimes over time, and and customer outcomes in more of a much bigger picture to really understand, you know, are we doing the right things that make our customers stay longer and, and improve the health of the business? I think you, you were doing some fantastic work uh, on that uh, at Legal Shield around really understanding, you know, what are the interactions that customers are doing with the with the product and, 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 and you know, how are they interacting with the service and how does that actually affect the, their, their life, their, their customer lifetime? Um, and one of the cool things is that when you get into more quantitative data, as I'm, I'm sure you, you you found it is that you really start to understand what are the how do the different types of customers uh, interact with the business, and how can I make sure I'm serving properly the, the different customer groups I'm, I'm getting in the door, and 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 some of that may mean that you have to you know embrace some customer groups more some customer groups you may say actually we're not going to do a good job we're not going to be able to do the best job serving these customers so we're going to move away from marketing to them uh, and actually move into other customer segments or or we're going to improve the cost the product to meet the customer's needs yeah that's a really good point oh uh, yeah our ceo says hey is do we want to focus on a customer who's born or made kind of like what you said do we want to focus on people who already we know would be good for us or do we want to change people's minds sometimes changing people's minds and trying to get to change their behavior maybe harder maybe mm -hmm. focusing on people who already we know that are a really good fit maybe a good start and then evolve into expanding it out depending on what kind of the goals that you have at the moment totally and, and we found a very good example of that with um with yourself online and when we were building that building the business that we we found very early on um there were some groups of customers that uh, even though the product was you know the product we were developing the product and improving the product in time it was still relatively it was, it was very early you know relatively early on we found there were some groups of products some groups of customers that were like yes take my money right now like i, I need this because I'm one good example is people who are professionals who were applying for jobs in 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 certain industries where they know they're going to get looked up and and that the, they know that the HR department at the company they're applying for is know they're going to you know check them up with either a background screen or a or a uh, or, or checking just out their social media you know, they were kind of like right take take my money take my money uh, and then we knew there were some um, some other customers that maybe could have found the service useful but they just they just weren't there at, at, at that particular stage in their life and, and 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 life stage where they were where they were you know that they 
they either would have had to be at a, a closer life stage to needing the product, or they may have actually maybe needed more education and, and more maybe you know more education and, 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 a, and a broader conversation around why they needed it. And given our resources at the time, we just would we just were thinking, okay, we just got to we just got to really focus on the customers that are the types of customers that are really putting their hands up and, and wanting this right now. That's yeah, that's a great point. We we just have to maybe focus on people who are looking for the exact product we're selling uh, sometimes, and then you know when you have resources, go go in and go all in on brand awareness and all the other things that needs to happen to 100 percent kind of bring them yeah really good point uh what is some of um the advice you have for somebody who's wanting to get into product um product first and then we can go into entrepreneurship maybe it goes hand in hand product and entrepreneurship i, th I think we'll a little bit hand in hand, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about products first. I think understanding, um, you know, un, uh, for, for, for really understanding product, I think spending a bit of time reading about the role of a, of a product manager. And um, it, it's quite a unique role because one of the things that product management managers do is, is they have, they don't generally have very many direct reports but they have to influence a lot of different parts of an organization um, and, and understanding that, you know, spending some time um, looking at, um, there are a number of different uh, books that I will, um, I've got in the bookshelf behind me, but I'm, I'm just thinking off the top of my head uh, that I will, uh, that, that I will, I'll kind of, I'll send you some links and you can put them maybe in your, in your chat um, afterwards, but really understanding that the, the, the the role of a product manager and kind of what makes a good product manager, what makes a bad product manager, um, really thinking about um, the, the entire product, you know, doing reading on on what that product life cycle looks like, where, where you know, the, the, the different from right from what's involved between starting a product, starting thinking about a product through to running it and operating it. Uh, and then thinking that's the sort of more on the functional side, but then on the on the other sort of sort of soft skill side, thinking a little bit about you know influencing people because a lot of the success in the role and this this kind of also applies with entrepreneurship as well is thinking about how you can how you can kind of influence people and and really um you know be able to affect change but without having uh authority over over the top of it um, and that that kind of applies a little bit with with entrepreneurship as well in terms of you don't have a huge amount of resources you've got to make things happen and, and how can you try and make that change happen with with limited resources and, and 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 also being able to kind of sell yourself to both you know your team your investors your customers um, and to sort of make things happen um, on the on the entrepreneurship side uh, i think um you know there there is there's so much stuff out there uh there's so many so many things written by so many phenomenal entrepreneurs um they were just you know that that really the, the sort of the inter of interesting ones that i've um i've read recently or i'm reading uh that could be what bit of interest to your readers i've been reading this one which is um by, uh, fall in love with the problem uh not the solution by uri levine uh, who was the founder of co-founder of Waze that was you know acquired by Google? Um, he's a serial entrepreneur, really focusing on understanding the customer and, and 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 understanding customer needs and the idea that you know you're better off understanding the customer and the problem than having a solution that's looking for a problem or a hammer that's looking for a nut. You're better off making sure you start with being being customer centric. Uh, on top of that, other other recommendations. Um, you know, there's, there's the classic Eric Ries, uh, Lean Startup, um, but the, one that's particularly relevant for, for data uh, is a book called Lean Analytics. And it, it, it really describes the data that you should measure in a, in a product and, and both from, a, it's sort of from an entrepreneur, it's useful for an entrepreneurship, but also for product in general, of how you can take more data, data database decisions, um, what the typical things to measure are for different types of businesses, how you can kind of take an experiment-led approach. Um, I, I think one of the things that, that 
that we discussed a lot in yourself online is people talk in, in products and in, in, in digital around a b testing and oh we're just going to a b test and a b test it's hard to a b test until you think you have an a and it's when you when you have a decent a you can start a b testing <laughs> but until you have a decent a you have to like experiment and just do these kind of on off tests where you know you, you don't necessarily a b test it you just sort of make it better look what happens after a week and go okay did, did, did that make it work okay no we go back again we're gonna you know, you're in much more it's, it's not quite a or b it's a sort of on or off type approach to experimentation and, and getting data yeah that's a really good point because especially in startup environment where the product is you know, so new that you're still evolving hey did did i break something no keep going no all, all good all good <laughs> exactly exactly um what are some of the skills that are transferable across uh, things that you've experienced like uh, in product entrepreneurship you've all, uh, also have been corporate executive so are there any common skills that if people are trying to move from one to the other are there transferable skills can you talk about that on a on a so i started a little bit on, on a kind of functional functional side and then a bit more on 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 some uh sort of soft soft skills as well on the functional side doing data being comfortable with data data led decision making um is is something that you know, i've used all throughout and and getting really comfortable with gathering understanding what data to measure finding that data as much as you can and then using that to then make a decision and 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 saying to yourself okay i think this is a situation this is the hypothesis i want to try and approve or this is the question i want to answer to know whether i should do x or y um let's go gather the data or let's look at data to see if it supports that or disproves it um that's something i i use a lot during you know time in consulting time in tech time in entrepreneurship is just that ability to to kind of really know have a feeling of what data you should be you know using data to, to, to solve a problem um and and kind of answer questions and sort of being informed by data and on top of that um I think having a good understanding of um, uh, of kind of broader strategic problem solving as as well. So understanding how um, companies uh, work was always a useful one, and 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 kind of how you can then, based on that, you know, on structure, have a structured way to pro approach solving a problem. Um, then. Uh, sort of jumping around a little bit but but you know building on the data piece i think a basic understanding of 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 just kind of basic stats tools like the sort of stuff that you can do in excel is is super useful to get a feeling of, of what where your where your data is going um and then on, on top on then sort of above that uh is is that piece i mentioned a little bit before around um the sort of influencing uh understanding one of the things that i found really really valuable um, on the journey was was understanding this concept called social styles um, which is understanding you know your uh, particular social style and, and how you interact with other people and, and how you approach things versus other other people's um, one there's a there's a sort of uh, we used a, uh, a, a, a Google and also in my consulting days we used a model called um it was a sort of quadrant four quadrant model um myers briggs is similar but it's a little bit more detailed um and it was one of the things i found really Im important in terms of thinking about how you interact with other people and how you can make sure that you're you know putting yourself across in the best way to other people was understanding your own social style um and, and then understanding other people's social styles as well because then you you really understand how you can work most effectively with other people and, and and kind of do that piece where you can kind of say you can clearly communicate in a way that other people will relate to of, of what's in it for them what's in it for you why they should do something that you're suggesting why you should do something that they're suggesting and and and, and kind of just just generally be more effective absolutely i think yeah social style can be really effective any in any role that you know you're you're in now uh, especially i feel that it really applies in the data world because you are 
I mean, I can build all the models, all the intelligence, you know, I can, but if it's not implemented, then I'm just doing it for myself. hundred percent and understanding other people's point of view and, and their style um, really helps communicating. You know, one example is, is understanding a little bit whether your audience are more detail oriented people um, or, or they're people who are let you know really just interested in the, the top line executive summary and and you know what the the results first is the, the the kind of the the analysis to get to the results and, and and tailoring the message to get that so that that analysis actually lands with the audience and, and kind of makes change happen absolutely yeah i really like that you talk about understanding of data as one of the transferable skills across the different things different roles um, how does your relationship with data change with those roles as a product executive versus an entrepreneur? Do you go more into storytelling uh, when you're an entrepreneur, yeah, having to pitch an idea backed up with data and uh, sort of things? Very good question. My when I was thinking a little bit about this beforehand, I, I think you know that. that the biggest one is that you you don't when you're an entrepreneur you know the data you don't know and in some cases you're able because of that you're able to make more, slightly more of a feel more comfortable making a gut in tune's decision um, and so really you're you're happy to operate with uh, a slightly lower confidence you know lower confidence in in your in your data than maybe in a corporate setting um because you understand the the, the, the in-depth parts of the product you understand the in-depth part of the customer and you, you know you, you sort of are clo- you're cl- a lot closer to it so you're willing to deal with a, a little you have a higher level of willingness to deal with uncertainty um when you're in a when i was in a, in a corporate role I, I, you know you generally would would come under potentially more de- more scrutiny in your decision making from you know your stakeholders your management um so actually getting closer to the, all the numbers you can and, and and using less kind of um intuitive decision making is is a uh it was, was certainly what one of those things uh, i think the one of the things that i um you know, one of one of the learnings that between the differences is is you you're more like you need it's a little thinking a lot about audience um when we're in a um when i was in a in in, in doing the doing us off online we were a small team we all had an in-depth understanding of the product we then you know could communicate data quite freely without necessarily having to understand, you know, get bring people on board of what it was because they all knew the different stages of the product and they knew the things that we were measuring. And it was like, okay, cool. Well, this is this is where we are now. This is what we're trying to go to. And when you move to a more corporate setting, you know, you're working with stakeholders that maybe work across a bunch of different products uh, and they don't know what those metrics are, where they've come from or, or where they, they, they were. So you have to really bring people in a corporate setting, you have to bring people along for the journey uh, and also communicate in different ways so that a broad range of people can understand because you know, you might be presenting something that will have uh, somebody from, you know, I, I think there's some stereotypes here, but you know, you're gonna have everyone from people who can who can really understand the data and they want more detail and more detail right through to people who who really switch off when you, you show them numbers and, and they just want the high level kind of high level thing. Um, and, and that was the thing that, that as was a learning as well, is, is really thinking a bit about, you know, thinking understanding the numbers but also understanding who your audience is um and and these are trade-offs as well because generally because of that uh in an in an entrepreneurial environment because you're you have a much close team that's much close to the product and also you're more comfortable with ambiguity you can move faster uh, and feel confident in that whilst in a corporate setting you you just naturally by the broader range of people you're working with potentially and and their knowledge and, and and their styles you have to move slightly more slowly, you have to be slightly, you know, uh, uh, and you have to have the detail and have the thinking to be able to to, to, to kind of 
compensate for for that scenario. Yeah, like you said, you have to get people to buy in, and that takes time. So it's it's like moving a large ship versus a boat. I feel like uh, we touched on storytelling a little bit there. Um, it's uh, I feel it's a very important part of you know being a leader. Uh, what are your thoughts about it? Uh, what's your advice for someone who wants to get better at it? Is there anything apart from yeah? So go ahead. I think less is so two two things from probably my experience of pitching yourself online, and and that was that was the most probably the most the, the most um, relevant of having to take a story that has data points in it and be able to have this different versions of these stories, whether it's the, you know, 60 second version, the three minute pitch in front of a room of strangers or the half an hour pitch in front of a room of educated investors, you have a, you have the different versions of this story. Um, I think the first one is, is less is more. Um, I think it's very, easy to try and put lots of information in there and be like facts 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 and the reality is that that certainly most people uh they, they just they just tune out after a certain point and one of the things also is that when you you have a point of uh you've got a point of diminishing returns on information where if you there'll be a point in the story you're trying to tell or the, the point you're trying to put across or the pitch where if you cram more detail into it, you actually get to a point where people don't want to engage more because it's starting to hurt their hurt their head. And so their instinctive thing for their brain is just to kind of go, okay, like I want to make sense of people's brains want to make sense of this information. And and they'll get to the point where they, they it's just too much for them. And so their natural thing is just to sort of withdraw. Um, so less is more. Um, and then the other one is making the data as much as you can in the story relatable. Um, in a way that um, sometimes when people, you know, will, will tell, uh, story tell with data, they will um, put up, you know, put up big numbers. But often, organizers, often, you know, in, individuals, the people at the receiving end of that story can't make sense of what it means. Um, so being able to put a, uh, you know, being able to, to, to give a key point uh, and being able to have some sort of reference point of what that means. So it's a kind of, you know, one example could be, you know, this year our organization, um, you know, lost 5,000 liters of, of water in our in our facility. Um, you know, the, the people might go, oh, I don't know if that's a lot or this or that, but then you might say, well, they lost 5,000 5, liters of water, which is the same as two Olympic sized swimming pools. And people go, oh, wow, that's a lot of water. So being able to give people things that they relate to in that story will mean that they can, it just makes it more impactful and, and, and makes it more relatable. Um, and then less is more and, and really thinking about uh, what's the hierarchy of information you're kind of trying to, trying to communicate. Um, uh, and there's a really interesting py principle uh, called the, the Minto principle, which is a, a, a pyramid. It's a sort of pyramid, the idea that you can structure information in a pyramid where you have one main point that has supporting points underneath and then they have supporting points underneath those. Um, and that's a, that's a very good way to be able to make sure you're not putting too much into it and to make sure it all stacks together. Yeah, definitely. Less is more is something that I've learned over the years and Minto principle is, is great. In, in my experience, I think I've learned that, you know, I've got so many things I want to say. I've, I'm, I'm in the data, I have so much information that I used to just go and blabber all of it and then kind of lose people midway because like you said, it's information overload and people are tuning out. So how do you have that one single point in a conversation? That's my main point I want to drive home. And then you don't have to necessarily convey everything all at once. You know, you may have to take it slow, but make sure that the 
point is effectively communicated i think it's more for the data folks and listening right uh, that's really important and yeah less is more and it's uh, it's definitely something that i've learned over the years um speaking of you know we were talking about data and um, how it's being used uh, you worked at uh, google you mentioned as an analytics consultant uh, google is one of the best companies in the ai and data space uh, what can you tell us about google's approach to ai and data and what can we learn from it so i have to caveat this response by saying i, I left in uh, 2017 so it's a little bit out of date now but I think the ethos of the company, you know, the, the ethos of the company is probably still still remains. And and that was the, they had a really, really strong um, preference in the organization for self-serve, uh, of actually self-serving your data. And, and everyone from, you know, whether you're a product manager or you're a sales analyst or you're a sales manager would be encouraged to to run their own data to the best of their abilities and and there would be you know there would be tools you know from 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 you know there'd be tools and controls from everyone being able to you know that that, that, that would protect that data from it you know some people would have access to product logs and some people had access to rolled up tables in a kind of self-serve ui type thing but the the, the effect of that meant that it um it, it democratized access for data across the organization. It meant that there wasn't necessarily silos, data sitting in silos, or um, you know, people who were looking to try and you know, or, or, or data being a kind of bottleneck in the process of making decisions in the organization, because the you know, the, the, for, for the things that most people would need to do in their job they'd have access to tools that would be able to give it to them uh, and would be expected to do that regardless of kind of what level you're at. Um, admittedly, that there would be, you know, at a director level or a senior director or an MD level, they would have their own dashboards that would be built for them. But, you know, they, they, they wouldn't get a report email to them with numbers. They'd go on and they'd look at it and they'd, you know, they'd do that. But, uh, and, they, and they could be able to double click and go into things if, if they wanted to. Um, so that was, I think, one of the learnings was when you when you are able to to make sure that data is not siloed and, and data is not a, you know, we've just, oh, we'll make a request to the analytics department and they come back. It's actually being able to say that everyone is expected to, regardless of their job, be able to, to, to get this stuff, get their hands, you know, hand, get their hands on the stuff and actually use it um, was it was a, was sort of change the organization. Uh, and that also came with um, transparency as well which was which was both from the product data um naturally there are controls on this around privacy and around gdpr and, and also around some of the data which is just is just very sensitive that google handles um but being able more broadly to within an organization be able to see the data that a particular team is 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 measuring to be able to see their objectives against that information to be able to see their you know their, their their KPIs to be able to see their OKRs as a team means that you're able to when you're interfacing with different teams you're able to go oh, okay I've I'm working with this person in search okay I know that I can look that person's up objectives up I can look at their team's objectives up I can understand how they're tracking against it and I can go to them and say hey like I need to land this project you are, you're working on the same thing in a different market. How about we work together and then we'll both help meet our objectives on it because you can see what they're working on and you can see how they're motivated and you see you can see what how how you know how the things they're responsible for what how they're performing but also how their you know their team is performing it's, it's kind of cool to see that transparency as, as well as being able to self-serve and that also comes with lastly i think an education um and and with education you, you shouldn't necessarily force You've got to realize that your different team members will have different skills and, and, and you know people that write marketing narratives are not going to be able to necessarily query sql uh, or, or or do regression models or anything like that but you know there's different people and, and but at the, and at the same time there's people that are going to want to go deeper than that but for people's level they should have appropriate access to to training that helps them build skills 
that help make their job more effective in you know up to the limit of their willingness to, to learn and their willingness to sort of take it in um was was one thing and and, and having a, a training curriculum and access to training that will take you know people every, everywhere from people who are very um you know who who are not you know who who whose jobs are are not super data heavy but they do need to you know they do need to look at data and they're more you know maybe more emotive people uh to be able to understand the concepts of data right the way through to training for people that want to do you know phd the phd level stuff or like deep machine learning and all of that kind of those you know really really deep concepts and being able to offer training across that spectrum i think is, is important yeah that's one of the biggest challenges as a data person i have right how can we make it how can we democratize data for everybody of all skill levels um and data it's it's a really um solid challenge and uh you made a really good point on having transparency on other people's OKRs or other teams' objectives. I think that's really a great point on getting alignment. How can I, you know, how can I understand what the other team is doing so that I can align myself to their goals, you know, kind of both of our goals can be aligned and kind of work together. That's really a solid point. A hundred percent. And and both the 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 the, the products or the potentially areas of business that the team is responsible for and the team's metrics themselves is, is important to be able to do both because you can see sometimes how they how they relate as well and and having that transparency uh, i think really helps people to work together and and helps people you know be aligned when they're working on these kind of multi stakeholder uh, multi departmental projects absolutely Again, I think it comes back to your earlier point on how can people work across uh, different teams and not work in silo and, you know, all the aspects of storytelling, less is more, having greater transparency, all of that plays into into this. Um, let's switch gears to reputation management and AI for a second. Uh, I feel that in the era of AI, it's so easy to just ask a question, type a question into chat GPT, and then it gives you everything. Uh, so if I type in, hey, tell me something about James Chance, it'll do the research for me and then pick out all of your quotes from 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and then kind of i can actually i full transparency actually tried this and then it gave me some really good quotes of yours and kind of we can also I, I could also ask it what does what is james's thought about data or product management and things like that and like it it gave me some good answers i don't know if it was making it up or if it's your you know article somewhere or not but so the, the point is, it's so maybe reputation management is more relevant than ever because you have the best research tools in history access by almost everybody. So it's, it's really becomes important to manage your own reputation in the web versus in the past where people may if you just kept your social media clean, it may have worked. But going forward, I think with these AI tools, it may be more relevant and more important to have better reputation management. What are your thoughts? Hundred um, percent. And firstly, I, I hope I, I hope ChatGPT hallucinated some some good things about me on on, the, on there. It sounds like it might have done. Um, but I, I, I totally agree with you. I, I, previously, um, we were in an age where if you kept your social media clean and and you 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 sort of managed and curated your you know first page of Google you could not really worry about anything that's that's behind that and now we're in a world where 
these tools have the the processing power and these models have the complexity that is it's almost like going through you know doing a google search for somebody and reading and synthesizing every single result or close to every single single result i mean i don't think we're on every single one yet but um a hundred percent and 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 then it just becomes you know it, it becomes a slightly different challenge at, at scale um because then it's really a bit about saying okay you know what am i what do I say now and what is my online presence now and what's my online persona now uh, and does that really align with who I am and, and and then working back and trying to understand okay where is this information coming from and then what what power do I have over it and the, the one of the things that that is a challenge about providing reputation management at scale is a lot of a lot of there are, you know some if, if there is something that is illegal that's about you, you you have powers to take it down um if it's something that is uh deflammatory or, or or you know that is untrue you you do you have potential part you know abilities to to court you know have, have to make requests to google make requests to courts all of that sort of stuff but that's a pretty hard process to do at, at scale um so then the question then comes about saying okay well how can we make sure that we're putting the right things about ourselves out there that we're you know that we're really reflecting you know we're we're, we're we are ref- making sure that we're reflecting what we want to be seen you know our, our, our true version of ourselves online so there isn't anything that that necessarily is going to start confusing things um so it has made the process of reputation you know management is is now a it, it is a big it, it's got monumentally larger uh as a, as a challenge and it, it's interesting to see you know how how things will evolve over time especially when you you think about how easy it is to generate this information from these ai tools to put out there and, and also the the unfortunate ability that you're now able to do things like deep fakes as well um and 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 how that affects people's reputation and, and being able to call out actually is this is this thing you know whether it's text or it's uh images or video it has this actually been generated by a person or is this actually been auto generated and just dropped out there as potentially some sort of defamation campaign um that's when it it, it starts getting really scary and there is a couple of startups or or actually now they're growing very fast um was one business called Reality Defender and it's looking at deep fakes around reputation and it's looking around deep fakes primarily for companies uh, and uh companies and, and and also kind of high net worth individuals uh media personalities and looking at things that are out there uh on people and actually saying you know trying to reverse engineer the image or the video and, and try and understand is this being generated by a person or or or, or an AI and it's going to be an interesting space to watch for sure for sure it's it's rapidly evol- evolving and kind of scary at times now uh, <laughs> uh what's your advice for individuals to better manage their reputations and digital footprints in the era of ai i think the first one is is having a re- having an understanding yourself of what's out there um so taking the time to google yourself taking the time to go back a few pages um and 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 also taking the time to look at the 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 privacy settings on uh the different uh web pages that you know you you come up in so for example you know the the, the thing i'd really say to somebody is you know one do a google audit two go back to your social media um posts your social media platforms and and make sure that your privacy settings are, are locked down um also potentially think about what's your um do you still need that information up there um so one of the things that i've 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 done and you could say that maybe this is because i've worked in reputation management it is actually say actually if i don't need that social media page up there if i don't use instagram actually i'm going to take it down i'm going to delete it because it just helps really managing that 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 footprint um and, and making sure that you're aware of the footprint you do have the privacy controls on things um that uh that you can that you know you have potentially deleted old profiles 
you know, maybe if you had a, a Flickr account, a Pinterest account, you know, all of these old services, making sure that, you know, you're, that, 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 that if you have, you delete them. Uh, there are um, a number of different services that help you get an understanding of what that online footprint is. Um, the, the, the Yourself Online Divs, which is now part of ID Shield, will help people give you an understanding of what, where you appear publicly. So understanding those sites is important. Um, and then beyond that, my last recommendation is having having done an audit, done a lockdown, done a clean up, is think about are you projecting yourself in the best way? Um, and, and it doesn't have to be a, a PR campaign, but just making sure that you know, you've got your LinkedIn updated, it's a clear bio for yourself, it's putting across where you are right now. Um, if you do something that's interesting in your spare time that you think people might learn about, maybe having a, a blog page or having, um, you know, a bio page and, and just being thoughtful about what you share um, uh, to making sure that, you know, that you're communicating what you want to share on your terms rather than what you might have shared unwillingly, uh, unwittingly over the last decade or two uh, that's being picked up. Absolutely. Yeah, I think there is some responsibility on us to kind of go back and you know see what we've done in the past and probably um, clear it out and like the services you mentioned are definitely helpful um one of our you know questions is what's the dream state for you um in terms of AI and data, if you had a magic wand and time and resources weren't constraints, what kind of intelligence tools and models would you have? Very good, very, very good question. Um, I think that the, the, for me, the, the, where I'm thinking about, about data and, and the, where we, AI, to, AI tools now are um, is, is having more, firstly, having more understanding of, of where things are coming from uh, in, in the responses you're getting from, from certainly generative AI tools, um, just to be able to, because it's one of the things that makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable in having certainty to be able to use some of these tools more, is just having that uncertainty around exactly where the stuff is coming from. Um, I know uh, OpenAI is starting to do more referencing, but I think there's still a long way to go in terms of having um, accountability uh, in AI. And, 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 and as these models get used more widely to do more decision-making, having uh, making sure that these models are, are not black boxes is, is really key to making sure that we're implementing AI in a um, in a sustainable way and, and, and a way that that doesn't disadvantage particular groups of people or or you know confirm biases and 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 one of the big, this is one of the big challenges of, of of the learning corpuses that these LLMs are feeding on is that there's you know that some of the material they're feeding from is going to be biased in in some way and, and making sure that we're not just you know feeding the machine this content but then it's going to generate more content at the same so we're just in this kind of you know never-ending loop of uh of, bad of, 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 uh bad stuff is, is 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 kind of scary that i think would be my magic ones one number one um it, it's just that accountability and, and being able to to not be in a black box is it, it's really that i think that would be so valuable for the rollout of these tools the certainty the general certainty of these tools and, and the kind of wide rollout across humanity yeah that's a solid answer yeah it's a uh, again super rapidly evolving uh, technology and we don't know how they work exactly uh, in a lot of ways nobody knows so it's it's kind of important to have those guardrails and understand you know how it's doing its thing awesome uh, this was a great conversation i learned a lot james uh, appreciate your time so much uh, thank you any last thoughts for our um viewers or myself i think one of the biggest things I, i've learned um on my kind of journey with with uh entrepreneurship and generally in in my kind of business life is is just experimenting uh just go out and experiment and and you know think about how you can de-risk decisions for yourself decisions for starting a business and and, and i think using data 
as part of that experiment is is really has the key to really deciding what you're going to do next and how you're going to develop your career or how you're going to develop a business or how you're going to grow a business is is really key and, and not being afraid to experiment uh, is is really critical and one of the big things I've, I've learned over my career. Thank you.